Well, hello, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about making uh, selections of vegetable varieties. Um, there's a lot of seed companies out there with paper catalogues and online catalogues. Um, and the, the range of varieties is bewildering. Now, in growing flowers, ornamental plants, you kind of choose what attracts you. It's not so difficult. With vegetable varieties, though, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, how do you decide between, I don't know, 30 varieties of carrot? Um, the range at the moment does seem to be particularly big, um, but I remember looking back through some late Victorian um, seed catalogues, that's kind of 1880s, 1890s, and again, really astonished by the incredible range of, of, of cultivars available. And of course, in those days, uh, those catalogues are really for the head gardeners of, uh, of, of, the, of the wealthy. And these were experienced men who could make uh, decisions based on what they knew of many years experience, uh, often their whole lifetimes experience of, of working in a particular garden for a particular um, estate owner. Um, then there was a sort of big period of decline. And now, <coughs> again, we seem to have this, this vast variety. Now, it's important to realise that this vast variety of vegetable, seed, vegetable seeds is not for the benefit of the home gardener, uh, that there's very, very little development done of new varieties for the home gardener. So what the home gardener is getting is, is really the spin-off from grow, uh, breeding for commercial growers. And, and in many ways, that's a really good thing because it means the amateur grower is getting the benefit uh, of varieties that, that are bred to really perform well. Um, but there are certain disadvantages, and it's those advantages and disadvantages that I'm going to flag up now. Um, so, um, Started off talking about carrots. Let's talk about carrots. <clears throat> now, um, uh, I've taken as an example pages from the Thompson and Morgan catalog. Uh, this is not to endorse Thompson and Morgan, but I'm using them because their range of varieties is definitely wider than anybody else uh, in Britain. Um, and also their page, their online pages fit rather nicely onto my onto my keynote. Um, so uh, we've got the first page that comes up online here um, and uh, we've noticed that they, you know, they all look pretty similar. Uh, and the thing to realise about carrots and indeed all hardy vegetables is that these are plants that have been around a long time and they're very, very widely distributed. The wild carrot, for example, is found from the very, very tip of, of Western Europe. Uh, uh, be that uh, Cap Finisterre or uh, Land's End, right the way across pretty well into um, Western China. Um, so an enormous range of climate zones. Um, so these, these are plants that will grow pretty much anywhere. Uh, and any idea that uh, a local carrot variety is somehow going to be better adapted for that area is really utter nonsense because the, these, these, that variety will probably has the genetic heritage to do as well in Land's End in Cornwall or in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. Um, so where conditions are utterly different. That of course does not apply to all vegetables and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit more in the context of tomatoes. Um, now here we are with our carrots and um, Thompson Morgan sell 28 varieties of carrot which is um, good on them. Um, F1 hybrids. You notice immediately that some are called F1 hybrids. Uh, usually they're more expensive, or if they're not more expensive, you're going to get a lot fewer seeds in the packet. F1 hybrids um, are essentially bringing together two different distinct lines, uh, genetic lines, uh, and that means that the uh, cross-pollination has to be done very, very carefully uh, and is expensive. Um, if you sow the seed, if you gather seed from an F1 hybrid, it's quite widely known this, and sow it, you will not end up with that variety, you, you will end up with something quite different. Uh, so this is uh, F, another reason why F1 hybrids are, are, are expensive, is you, you, you can't save the, the seed. Uh, whereas so-called open pollinated or traditional or conventional varieties, 
usually by sowing, if you save your own seed and sow it, you will pretty much get what you started out with. Although personally, I would recommend you always buy seed from a reputable supplier. So F1 hybrids, why would you spend extra money on F1 hybrids? Well, they are consistent, they're bred for very particular reasons. Um, often though, as an amateur grower, that's not really that, that important. Uh, to be honest, looking at carrots, uh, there's not a vast amount to choose between them. Um, there are occasional varieties that are uh, bred, or in this case, where you've got different colours, uh, different genetic lines put together for uh, sort of what we could call the heritage market, which is a sort of romantic thing about thinking about you know, old varieties and wanting to, um, it's another aspect of vegetable growing, to, to grow unusual varieties or varieties that perhaps your great, great, great grandfather might have grown. Um, but uh, th these are really a very small part of the market. Now, while we're talking about carrots, uh, one, of the, one of the distinctions you'll notice between different varieties is how quickly they mature. Naught varieties uh, tend to be early. You sow them early, they mature quickly, um, they're, they're, they're good for that early crop. Uh, we do tend to find this is one of the distinctions between all these different varieties is, is the time it takes them to, to mature. Uh, some varieties are bred to be juicier than others, sweeter flavour, for, for example. Uh, this may mean that they don't necessarily keep so well, but uh, it does mean that they're great for salads or to eat raw. If you like crunching a raw carrot, something like Sweet Candle F1 might be a good one. And then, of course, uh, we have the heritage market, which um, is it's, it's always been there. It goes up and down in popularity. Uh, it's what the Americans call heirloom varieties. Um, to be honest, uh, I, I'm a bit sceptical about these, um, but uh, for a lot of people, they're, they're part of the fun. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, one of the really important reasons as to why you might want an F1 hybrid is that it's disease, pest and disease resistance. And anyone who's had any experience growing carrots will know one of the worst things that can happen to them is when the carrot fly zooms in just above ground level like a missile after smelling the carrot, sees the carrot, goes down, lays its eggs, and you get these horrible little larvae that burrow away and completely ruin your carrots. Carrot fly is a really big problem. So not surprisingly, genetic research uh, managed by the big seed companies has produced several varieties which are, have a very, very high level of carrot fly resistance. They don't produce the chemical that the, uh, the carrot can, the, the fly can spot, but they can spot it from kilometers away. Um, they, um, and of course, this has no impact whatsoever on, on the flavor. I've grown these, they're really good. If your area suffers from carrot fly, if you've had carrot fly in the past, it is really worth it spending out the money on these. Let's move over to broccoli. Now, um, we've got uh, various varieties here. Broccoli and calabrese are sort of kind of almost the same thing, really. They sort of merge into each other. Um, quite a good range of varieties. And again, we see some that are um, F1, some that are conventional, and then organic. Uh, some people like to grow seeds that is produced from organically grown plants. Personally, I'm a skeptic about organic growing. Uh, it's completely incapable of feeding the world, for, for example. And really how much difference uh, organic seed production makes to the kind of big picture of the world's environmental problems, quite frankly, is probably pretty small. Now, here's a good old traditional early purple sprouting variety. I, I've grown it myself. Um, it's, it, it's a very good doer. Um, and one of its advantages is a massive disadvantage for the commercial grower. We grow this uh, and realize quite quickly that the, there's a lot of genetic variation, uh, which means that they produce their sprouts over quite a long period. Um, they may start in late February and the last ones you may be picking in, in late April, which if you're a home grower is perfect. Uh, for a commercial grower, you want everything to come at once. The last thing you want to be doing is sending your picking teams uh, or your tractor out into the field more than once. So uh, F1 high broccoli hybrids, I would not touch with a barge pole because they'll all come at once. You'll eat yourself silly on broccoli and you'll end up giving most of it away. 
the uh, problem of continuity of supply has been recognised by some of the seed suppliers. Uh, so we have things like the all season collection where you have several varieties put together um, several packets that come in, in, in one big packet and a great idea for, for getting that continuity of, of, of supply. And let's move on to leeks. Uh, and again, uh, incredibly hardy vegetable. Um, people grow these in the Falkland Islands or the Malvinas. Uh, they grow them in Siberia, they grow them in Korea. And Korea has a really, really hard winters. Um, um, this has always been recognised as one of the great advantages of, of the leek as a vegetable. Um, not a massive amount of variation between them. Uh, the varieties for early maturing, late maturing, quite frankly, I didn't see much difference. The one thing I would go though for is to try and, well, personally, the problem we used to have when I used to grow them a lot in, in the west of England on the Welsh borders was rust, which is very disfiguring, completely ruin the crop and really doesn't look very nice. Um, so uh, varieties like Oarsman, if you look, look at what the, uh, the um, seed catalogue actually say about these, uh, they will always say if they're resistant to a particular disease. And this is one of those that happens to be rust resistant. So um, yes, they cost a lot more to the, the seed. And uh, yes, you really have to look after those little seedlings because leek seedlings are very slow. But uh, I always found these rust resistant varieties so much more worth growing. Now let's move on to tomatoes, which are really one of the most important crops for the home gardener. Tomatoes are a really, really special crop. I mean, they, they taste fantastic, but also there's an enormous genetic diversity that makes them very, a very, very interesting vegetable to, to grow. Um, and uh, it, it, so it, trying out different varieties is, is part of the fun of, of, of growing tomatoes. There are varieties like Moneymaker that have been around a long time, uh, was originally bred for um, commercial growers quite a long time ago, I think kind of maybe even pre-war. Uh, and it's always been very popular. It's very reliable. It produces traditional shaped, traditional color, traditional size tomatoes. Um, not necessarily though a particularly brilliant uh, flavor. Then there are varieties like Gardener's Delight, which is one that dates to the 1930s, renowned for having a really fantastic flavour. Um, that balance between sweetness and acidity, which is so good. But for anyone who's grown this, it's, a, it's really one of the most difficult varieties to grow. They're particularly tall plants, which means they need a lot of support. They split very, very easily. Any irregularity in water supply, um, and they'll split like nobody's business. Um, and uh, there are now so many other varieties that, are, that, that also have a very good flavour, um, but uh, are much easier to grow. Um, and of course, again, we have uh, these F1 hybrids, uh, which in the case of tomatoes, where you are growing on very few plants, um, that really makes sense. Um, there's a big range now in size. We have the big ones like Gourmandia um, and little ones like Super Sweet. Uh, the little ones, of course, really nice just to pop in the mouth. Uh, the bigger ones are, have far less skin proportion to flesh. So if you're cooking with them, making sauces, or you're drying them, or in any way processing them, really, they're generally the, the bigger the better. Now, the key thing with tomatoes is, of course, for uh, growers in Northern Europe uh, and much of the United States, they are a marginal crop. They're only... you. They're very frost tender, frost will kill them. Uh, they will not grow at cool, in cool nighttime temperatures because they're tropical plants. So getting varieties that mature quickly and grow well in your climate is really, really important. Now, uh, I managed to find quite a bit of information online for American growers, very little I'm afraid for British or other European growers. Um, this American website um, is, uh, does give you on the third column uh, the number of days from uh, germination to first harvest. Uh, so the shorter, the, the lower that number, the more, the better it's going to be for those in northern latitudes. Um, do some research online. There's a lot of stuff online about growing tomatoes. One of those things where the web does really well. Do that research and find those varieties that will, will do well for you. 
Uh, heritage tomatoes, uh, one of the joys of tomatoes is this, this is incredible a variety of colour and shape and indeed flavour. But do we really want to make such a fetish out of growing heritage varieties? For tomatoes, yes, it's part of the fun, it's part of the experience. But if you just basically want you know, a good, supp reliable supply of vegetables, I do not understand why you would choose old varieties over new. I mean, driving a classic car, it's good fun, but you know, I would not want to necessarily to drive this from one end of the country to the other. Uh, it's slow, high fuel consumption, they're more polluting, uh, they're not particularly safe. You know, we don't drive old cars around unless we're doing it for fun. Same, I think, with vegetable varieties for the most part. With tomatoes, diseases are a big problem. They are very prone to a lot of different diseases, which tend to vary enormously from one place, one region to another. So do your research. And here, this uh, I found really quite quickly, uh, a British site, um, which uh, talking about blight. And in the west of, of the British Isles, wet climate, humid summers, uh, potato and tomato blight can be a real problem, can devastate your plants. Uh, so here we are, uh, these are all F1s, uh, these are some of the ones to go for if you know blight is, is a problem. Uh, now, it is important to choose the, the right varieties for your climate. Um, my own experience of Brandywine and Black Russian really illustrates this. Um, I've grown both of these uh, in Herefordshire uh, in the west of England. Um, Brandywine has a terrific reputation amongst American growers as having really, really good flavour. Herefordshire, hopeless. Uh, cool summers, it just does not seem to bring out the flavour. Um, I'm now living in central Portugal, and last summer it was one of it was our pretty much our best variety, you know, wonderful flavour. Black Russian, uh, a wonderful plant for northern Europe, as you might imagine. The Russians, for some reason, ended up with genes that not only give their tomatoes this strange purpley colour, but also give them very, very good flavour. Black Russian is a fabulous tomato, uh, meaty, um, really good flesh, fantastic flavour, really good in difficult conditions. In Portugal, very low yielding, complete waste of time. So, there we are. I um, hope that was helpful. Uh, do your research. It's a great business. It's a great way to spend a cold winter's evening looking through seed catalogues. Uh, as I said, try and do a lot of research on online if you want to really get, get, get the best. Uh, don't get hoodwinked by uh, heritage heirloom varieties. Uh, go, for, go for the advantages of, of modern science, modern breeding, and um, enjoy your vegetables. <laughs>